Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Hello and welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Sands, and I'm here to help you make the most of your mineral rights and royalties. And Justin Williams joins me as always. Hey, Justin. Hey, good afternoon, Matt. Good afternoon. Uh, Another afternoon recording session here. We were talking about how our schedules were having to shuffle around with the summer and vacation plans and and this and that. And uh, it's definitely been busy. I know you've been busy with, uh, with everything you have going on. Yep, absolutely. I sure have. And we're we're trying really hard to get away for the uh, 4th of July weekend to enjoy this uh, beautiful Colorado weather that's hotter than I was expecting it to be already. Yeah, hotter than I was expecting as well. And, you know, that kind of is a good segue into this week's episode, which is going to feature uh, an author, uh, Ian Palmer, who wrote the book, The Shale Controversy, talking about climate change and stuff like that. So just a teaser. But switching gears here, we're going to talk about mineral rights news for July of 2021. I can't believe that we're already halfway through the year. Uh, What do you think, Justin? It is just flying by. I cannot believe it. But, uh, you know, at least we've made it this far and things are kind of looking normal. Uh, So that's going the right direction. Absolutely. And hopefully that continues through the rest of the year. So do you want to go ahead and dive in to this first article? I really was excited to see this. Uh, something I've been following pretty closely the past several months, but uh, let's go ahead and dive in. Yeah, this is a really interesting one. And had I not heard it from you, Matt, I would have absolutely no idea. So I'm sure this will be a surprise to some of our listeners. So Bitcoin mining digging for EMP's natural gas gold in the lower 48. A symbiotic relationship is forming in North America between oil and gas uh, producers and miners of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. Both groups are seeking to capitalize on immense volumes of excess and or stranded natural gas flared off or shut in by a lack of infrastructure. Bitcoin miner offers a new outlet for this gas at the wellhead with no need to invest in pipelines, compressor stations, or liquefaction. So an interesting quote here, our goal is to monetize the gas as well as solve some of the environmental problems of leaking wells and flared gas, said Easy Blockchain CDO Sergi, and I'm not even going to try the last name here. The company uses excess natural gas to power its on-site Bitcoin mining operations at several production sites through North America. It's not just a one-way road here. I do want the oil and gas producers to participate in this industry. And like you mentioned, Matt, uh, this was something that you kind of brought up. And what an interesting uh, way to utilize that gas being flared. It is. It's really a novel way to use it to allow operators to produce the crude oil that has associated gas with it. When we talk about associated gas, again, that's sort of like the gas natural gas that's produced as a byproduct of oil, whereas the primary product is is oil, and that's what they're um, going after. And there's maybe not infrastructure in place in the terms of pipelines to allow them to sell the gas. And so what has been happening in many states, actually, up until more recently, where states are starting to crack down on this, but um, operators were simply flaring the gas. You'd see like that torch light in a picture, you know, that's a, a flare, and they were just burning it off. They were not selling it. They were not able to because they didn't have pipeline to sell it into. And you can set up like micro LNG plants and things like that, but they're not very efficient. They're very difficult to run and uh, just not very cost effective. It's actually cheaper if the operator can get a permit to flare. And that's what they've been doing. And so you have billions of cubic feet of gas. It's simply wasted and, and burned in a not a super efficient process. So you do have some methane that actually goes uh, into the atmosphere as well, which is, you know, you always hear now that greenhouse gas emissions are a important concern. And so methane is more heating capacity, so to speak, than CO2. And so if we can limit methane emissions, first of all, put it into beneficial use by generating electricity from it, that'd be much better than simply burning it and letting some of that methane go into the, the atmosphere. So it is something that's good for from an environmental standpoint because it is reducing those methane emissions. You're also then putting that natural gas to beneficial use to generate electricity so that they can use it to mine Bitcoin. And uh, in this case, when, you, when we say mining, a lot of people may not be familiar with what exactly that means. And basically, it is, in this context, the process of using these specialized computers that run the 
Bitcoin algorithm, the cryptographic algorithm that it tries to solve these problems. And if you are the the um, computer that solves that problem, you get rewarded in Bitcoin. And so you're mining the, the Bitcoin or mi- mining other cryptocurrencies that use proof of work algorithms. And so what they do is they add blocks to the, the Bitcoin blockchain. And uh, we'll link to some articles that talk a little bit more about what is Bitcoin. It's probably a little bit of a fuzzy subject for, for those of you that maybe haven't haven't gone down the rabbit hole yet and uh, learned more about it, but it is something that I've really been following, been getting interested in cryptocurrency and then really interested in this concept of Bitcoin mining using flare gas or stranded natural gas on the well pad. And what they do is they set up a natural gas generator on the well pad, hook it up to the well, and then they have like a shipping container that's filled with these hundreds of these very um, specific Bitcoin mining computers called ASICs or application specific integrated circuits. And they sit there and generate power from the natural gas on the well pad. And then basically it's like a digital pipeline. If you would think of it as a way that you're able to monetize and produce the energy from that well and convert it directly into uh, digital currency. And so this is a, an amazing opportunity, I think, for both oil and gas operators. The nature of Bitcoin is that it's this decentralized network that you um, really are decentralizing when you have these individual mining factories or, or mines on individual well pads that are spread out across the country and across, around the world. So it does really fit into that um, the concept that really is what Bitcoin's all about and that it's a um, peer-to-peer distributed network. And so the thing that the article goes on to say is that it is also important to bring mineral rights owners into the fold, said Giga Crypto Inc. President Roger Dixon. And uh, this company mines Bitcoin in the Powder River Basin, the, the article mentions. There's a quote, one thing that was a surprise that's happened in some of the surface rights owners there, which mostly ranchers and ranching families are kind of upset at the way they've been treated by some of the operators in the past, Dixon told NGI. He said, in some cases, mineral rights owners have been excluded from arrangements between miners and operators to share in the revenue generated from cryptocurrency. One family offered to give Giga Crypto exclusive rights to mine Bitcoin at any wells on the family's property because, quote, we make sure they are compensated properly for their surface rights, Dixon said. So I think this is something that all mineral owners should pay attention to, especially if you have an interest in wells that are maybe only um, sporadically producing oil because of issues around emissions and flaring and stranded natural gas. Maybe there's not a natural gas pipeline. I know that companies have been mining Bitcoin uh, at well pads using natural gas in West Texas, in uh, the Bakken. And then this one, this article mentions the Uinta Basin in Utah and the Powder River Basin in Wyoming. And I know there's a little bit going on here in Colorado. I think it's sort of bits and pieces, you know, small groups are coming together to to start to do this in different jurisdictions where they're um, able to get low cost natural gas. The operator is able to sell, actually get something for that natural gas in most cases. Of course, it depends on the arrangement like this article alludes to uh, between that miner and the operator. But ideally, I think from a mineral owner perspective, you get the operator selling the natural gas for some value, potentially the spot value, you know, because it it is, uh, if it's economic for the the miner, they'd be willing to pay a little bit more for that natural gas because it's still cheaper than being on the grid from an electricity generation point of view. So I think this is important, you know, whether you're paid, I think the ideal situation is obviously the mineral owner should get paid for any natural gas that is used. I think this is something like we've mentioned before, that if you're signing a new lease, this is something you need to add language. Historically, we've allowed operators to, there's some vent or flare and and use um, that's allowed without having to pay for that gas. And typically it's been to like run a heater treater on the pad. And so it's not using very much natural gas, but then when we're, if you're hooking up uh, a series of natural gas generators and using all the well, all the gas that the wells are producing, 
then that's a different story and the mineral owners should get compensated for that. And I think that you need to set, we'll need to set some precedents around negotiating leases that make sure that we get paid. Now, the other, if you're really savvy and want to uh, do something really novel, you could see if you could get paid in Bitcoin, <laughs> you know, like you could have a royalty rate uh, and your you get your proportional share in, in cryptocurrency and, or in, in Bitcoin or whatever cryptocurrency they're mining using that gas. And so that could be some, another option where you're getting a royalty and you're actually getting Bitcoin instead of uh, fiat currency like the US dollar. So that'd be pretty cool to see uh, some folks try to negotiate that. So the reason that I wanted to highlight this article, because I think it is something that we need to be aware of and need to start taking advantage of this opportunity because it's only going to grow. I think you're going to see more resistance for miners being hooked into the grid because you're taking away from electricity from consumers, you know, especially in, you know, the wintertime when it gets really cold or in the summer when you have peak demand due to air conditioning, you know, it's hot out and uh, everybody wants to use that electricity. And so Bitcoin miners are going to be the first ones that are going to get uh, pushed away and, and, and shut off in that situation. And so I think you're going to see more and more miners going to this route to, uh, to mine Bitcoin and, uh, you know, we should take advantage of it. So pretty cool to see. Yeah. Very interesting. It'll be interesting to see if there's going to end up being precedent set. And I'm sure there will be at some point over the way that those, um, contracts can be written. Yeah, I agree. It'll be uh, fascinating to see how it develops. Totally new, um, concept. It's, it's amazing to think that these two worlds are intersecting like this. So, um, we'll talk about the next article here and it titled, Colorado Supreme Court asked to hear lawsuits seeking to stop Denver Oil Company's drilling plan. So first of all, I'll read a quote. This this article says, Boulder County is taking its three-year-old lawsuit against the Denver Oil and Gas Company to the state's highest court in an effort to stop drilling in the country. Attorneys for Boulder County petitioned the Colorado Supreme Court on Thursday, seeking to have it take up its case and reverse losses in state district court and the state court of appeals in its lawsuit against Crestone Peak Resources. So it says, Boulder County first sued Crestone Peak Resources in 2018 to challenge the legality of its proposal to drill 140 gas wells that would run under land the county owns to preserve as open space and private property preserved by the county through conservation easements. So I think that's a pretty interesting statement in and of itself, Justin, that they are wanting to basically block them drilling these horizontal wells that are going to extend underneath this open space that the county uh, owns. It's not going to have any surface disturbance. So it has going to have zero effect on these conservation easements. The surface will not be used for other purposes. They're not building a well pad on the in the open space. So it, it just shows the, you know, we've talked about this multiple times that, you know, moral difference of opinion around fossil fuels and they want zero fossil fuels. You know, if it was up to Boulder County, we'd all have solar panels and windmills, and that would be the way we would generate electricity. We just shut everything off at night because uh, there wouldn't be any power. Now, this particular situation is interesting that they're they're going to the state Supreme Court. So they lost the first couple of, uh, they first lost the state district court ruling and then the, the appeal to that. The county is asserting that because the Crestone uh, had some wells. I guess this these leases are held by production. They didn't produce for 122 days in 2014. And so now they're saying that that production stoppage cancels the lease. Any lease that I've seen, Justin, I, I always see a, a shut-in well payment for that. You know, you have like a dollar per net mineral acre. So it's a pretty low amount, but they can, the company can shut in wells for operational reasons, which is what happened here and then maintain the leases and then pay that small payment. Have you seen that as well in your leases? Exactly. And and I can't say that I've ever seen a lease that did not have some kind of provision for them to be able to keep that lease valid. Um, It's very expensive for operators to go get those leases, obtain those leases, and and they usually try their best to protect them. Yeah. And it's not unreasonable for them to not produce for a period of time, maybe due to operational reasons. Or in this case, I believe there was a pipeline capacity issue where they actually couldn't produce because they didn't have anywhere to go because the Another company's natural gas pipeline was closed for repairs. So it's like a force majeure type of situation. So very defensible on Crestone Peak's side of things that says, yeah, we couldn't physically even produce those because we had nowhere to take the gas. And I'm sure that if uh, 
push came to shove that Boulder County would not have wanted them to flare that gas. So, uh, you know, it seems like they were acting in the best interest of, of uh, the owners in that situation. Now, they're taking this tack just because physically they want to stop any and all drilling. Uh, the thing that the reason I wanted to bring this particular article to light was that what Boulder County has been doing is they've been implementing five-year drilling moratoriums that, that are, keep on renewing every five years since 2012. So no new oil well has been drilled in Boulder County since 2012, which is almost 10 years when we're recording this right now. And this rolling moratorium, you know, extended to 2017. And there was a lawsuit by the industry that challenged the legality. And so then Boulder County allowed the moratorium to expire because they knew that basically they they couldn't keep doing it because it would be effectively a, a government taking without um, due process and without paying mineral owners for the their property. And, uh, and so they are using this as a way to stop basically drilling. And, you know, they have implemented another moratorium uh, in 2019 that after the uh, Senate Bill 19181 went into place and gave more control over local governments issuing permits for drilling and dictating how oil and gas activity was to occur in their uh, jurisdiction. And so they declared a new moratorium. And I think really what, what this is, if you were to ask any of those county commissioners, ultimately they would like to ban oil and gas development in the county. I think they realize probably, you know, maybe that that would effectively be, again, a government taking. They would have to pay billions of dollars to mineral owners for taking their the value of their property without any compensation. They don't want to do that. So what they, the workaround is that by temporarily, you know, quote unquote, putting these moratoriums in pace, place and then simply just renewing them in perpetuity, uh, they can kind of get around that. So I think it is a something that is a very concerning development in Boulder County. Not super surprising because it's a very uh, liberal county here in Colorado in the front range. And, you know, they're very much opposed to oil and gas development. Don't know how they're charging their electric cars uh, if it's not by natural gas or coal-fired power plants because only a small percentage of our grid is uh, renewable. And so uh, sort of, you know, one of those ironic things where they, you know, we need to move in a, in all of the above energy strategy and plan to use renewables, you know, hydro, nuclear, and then, you know, natural gas, you know, to generate electricity. And it's this um, very polarizing viewpoint that I, th- I have a problem with where you get these, you know, not in my backyard, but then they're probably still going and, and driving Maybe they have electric cars, but, you know, still driving a car that is somehow or another has carbon emissions associated with it, whether it was in the, the manufacturing process of it and or the electricity that was generated to charge those cars. And if they ever get in, in a uh, an airplane and fly, then obviously that's another, um, they're using fossil fuels there. So can't get away from it. It's just the way that we've uh, developed into the standard of living that we enjoy here in the Western and developed world. And, you know, I think it is something we need to be realistic and pragmatic about this energy transition and not just basically ban oil and gas development and say, well, it's now we've, we've fixed the problem. Now we're, um, we're clean and we're green. So I don't know, Justin, I'll get off my soapbox here, but what do you think? No, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I, I guess what bothers me so much about these situations is it would be one thing. And I understand the moral stance of, of thinking that fossil fuels are not the way of the future but there are different ways of going about handling this that would be more fair for everyone. And rather than exploring those, it seems like there's so much time delaying and stalling and, and uh, why not just look at those other options if it's time to do that? Yeah. Why don't you, why don't we look at some other options and then also try to work together to solve this massive problem that we have around, you know, providing cheap, reliable energy for the billions of people that, you know, need it and deserve it. And so it's a, it's a tricky problem. Uh, this is not the solution though. So uh, Justin, you want to jump to the next article? All right. Yeah. And this is a, an interesting one here and, and definitely something I was glad to hear. So the federal judge reverses Biden's ban on new oil and gas leases for federal lands and waters, dealing a blow to the climate, climate change activists. 
And the uh, the article goes on here to say that the decision uh, is a blow to President Biden's efforts to rapidly transition the nation away from fossil fuels and thereby starve off the worst effects of climate change, including catastrophic droughts, floods, and wildfires. And so this goes on, Matt, and it it talks about Louisiana ruled that the the admission of any rational explanation and canceling the lease sales and enacting the pause results in the court ruling that the plaintiff states also have a substantial likelihood of success in the merits of this claim. And uh, Matt, this is really interesting. And, you know, something that I wasn't sure of and you could talk about here is, is this going to be something that we see carried through the rest of the United States? And, and this was multiple states. It affected, you know, Nevada, Colorado, Montana, New York, Utah, Wyoming. Um, and just kind of the list is long here. Yeah. And uh, the judge, the U.S. District Judge Terry Dowdy, who ruled on this, did say that it, his ruling applies nationwide. So it grants basically an injunction uh, against the moratorium on leasing and, and permitting. Uh, so the good that comes out of this, if you have mineral rights that are part of federal units, there's light at the end of the tunnel for those opening back up to leasing and to permitting new wells. So as we've talked about when this first broke in the beginning of the year when Biden took office, when they uh, issued the uh, the temporary ban, was that a lot of private mineral rights are impacted by this just because of the checkerboard pattern of private and federal minerals that sort of overlap many parts of the West, especially. And so what you ended up having is this federal federal move actually ended up impacting a lot of uh, you know private minerals. And so that is a, a bad situation because, again, like we talked about with the Boulder County situation where you have the government basically blocking development, which has an impact on the value of mineral rights, which is effectively then a taking of the value without compensation. And so the federal government banning leasing and banning drilling on federal lands doesn't just have an impact on those federal lands and the states that they're in and the potential severance tax revenue that they would have gotten, but then also on the private mineral owners that don't ha you know, have that ability to realize the value of their property. So, you know, I think this is a good ruling. I think it makes sense. The um, Interior Department, I think they were going to continue to include work that has been going on on these programs in terms of like what the next steps are. Because ultimately, they want to improve the stewardship of these public lands and waters, create jobs, and, quote, build a just and equitable energy future. So if they're going to build a just and equitable energy future, the way to do that is by leasing federal lands to then create jobs, to then generate income and allow people have access to cheap and reliable energy here in the United States. So, uh, you know, good for energy independence. Obviously, I don't expect that there's going to be any ma major swings or any major changes in the in the short term. Uh, I think ultimately what they're going to end up doing is probably just implement more bureaucratic steps in terms of permitting those wells, and they can do that through the Interior Department and the review processes to make sure that they're protecting the environment. And I'm sure they'll try to make it as hard as possible on operators to permit the wells if they can't physically put a ban on that process, they'll make it more difficult. But, you know, we are adaptable in the industry. Um, you know, we do need to do things in a way that is environmentally responsible, socially responsible. And to the extent that any changes that are made help us to that end, that, that would be good. But, you know, I definitely blocking it is not the right answer. So hopefully they'll sit down with experts in the industry and, and work on, you know, actual policies and procedures that are that kind of uh, are the middle ground that protect the environment, but then also allow for that responsible uh, development. So definitely victory for the thousands of people that work in the industry, and then also the thousands, if not millions of private mineral owners that are in this area where they have uh, adjacent to or affected by federal uh, oil and gas leases as well. So. No, and you nailed it. And the article mentions it grants a preliminary injunction. So technically a halt to the suspension pending further arguments on the merits of the case. So this is not going to be the last we've heard of this by any means. Great point. Yeah, not the last we've heard of it, but hopefully it does stand up and uh, and they can continue at some point. And again, in a responsible way. But, uh, you know, it's not it, it's the right thing to do, I think, to allow this to, to proceed. Couldn't agree more. 
All right. Well, that wraps up our uh, news articles for July of 2021. Hope you're having a great summer. Again, if you found this information helpful, please leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this show. And make sure that you subscribe so that you catch uh, any new content as it comes out. And as always, you can find links to these articles at mineralrightspodcast.com. Thanks again for listening. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy.